Hello. Thanks so much for, for chatting this morning. How, You're how welcome. are you in, in, in where in Indiana? Where exactly? Uh, I am in Marion, Indiana. So that's about three hours south of Chicago. Marion, I-O-N, Marion? M-A-R-I-O-N. Huh. Okay. Okay. Cool. So you get to drive Birth- up to Chicago for the fun, I guess. Well, once in a while. It's also debatably the birthplace of James Dean. Debatably. So. Yes, because nearby towns also claim him as, like, that's their hometown. Uh, Here's where his birthplace was. He's buried, like, 20-something minutes in Fairmount. So it's, anyways, okay. claim to fame, sort of. Cool, cool. The semi-claim to fame. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited to talk with you, and I'm just going to kind of read read your bio for folks who, who don't already know about what you're up to and all the awesome stuff you do. So Eric Fisher is the host of the award-winning podcast called Beyond the To-Do List, which features secrets from productive people showing how to complete good work and balance your life at the same time. He is also the social media manager at Social Media Examiner. When he isn't writing about bacon, which is just awesome, he (laughs) is more importantly a family man, tech enthusiast, comic book reader, and non-self-assigned productivity guru title wearer. Wow, that's a that's a mouthful. Yes. And he he likes to hang out in his home state of Indiana, which you know, in the specific town of Marion, which may or may not be the home place of James Dean. So awesome. (laughs) Yes. Um, We. We're talking before this about how when we first connected, it was about four, a little over four years ago, right when you started the Beyond the Yes podcast, because I yes. was, and I think it was because I reached out to you because I just was like in love with your podcast. <laughs> and I couldn't believe that there was actually a podcast out there that just asked people, you know, about how they could be more productive and how they were more productive and sort of the, the tips and tools they use. So yeah, that's when the love affair started. Yeah, thank you. Mm. So I'd I'd love to kind of dive into to talk about this idea of of productivity and really what you've been able to kind of glean from really learning from from the best over the last four years or more. Um, you know, you've kind of been in this interesting position where you've been able to talk to people who are really really good at this idea of kind of working, working better. And so I'm, I'm wondering, well, I'm certainly wondering if you've learned something, but, but more than that, I want to share how you sort of came to this. Are you someone you, you've always, you've always been really productive. This is something you cared about or what, what kind of brought you to this line of work? Yeah. Well, my superhero origin story with productivity goes back to, I think basically just hating to do homework. I always, you know, I would always think I've already been at school all day. Why do I have to do school at home now that I'm at home? That's my free time. So I would always try to figure out ways to game the system Mm. or get it done quicker. So I was always trying to find, I mean, and and again, some people look at the, the word I'm about to say as a bad thing, but the word shortcut. Hmm. OK, hmm. And, 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 and in terms of cutting corners, but I look at a I look at a shortcut as if you can achieve the same results and, you know, qu- qualify it without taking any ethical, uh, you know, shortcuts, I guess. But uh, if, you, if you can get the same amount of work done or get it done faster, then why wouldn't you? I've started to think that. Uh, there's this dichotomy where people say, well, you can work harder or you can work smarter. Hmm. I say working smarter is a version or a form of working harder hmm. because that I've always been a fan of the whole, uh, you know, lever and fulcrum and leverage. And it's like, hey, if you just move it a little bit one way or the other, less effort still gets the same amount of work done. You can lift heavier things just by changing where the if people can visualize that right so my mind was always looking at it like that early on so i would in high school i would skip lunch and go to the library and get homework done then so that it was done as soon as it was assigned so i didn't have to take it home Hmm. i did get better at not taking it home and actually getting it done but at first i didn't like doing it so Hmm. always that analytical mind that i gradually grew into realizing was a strength of looking at things and saying, okay, we do it this way. Why do we do it this way? Is there a better way to do it? 
and that, and so I've just been an, an always I, I, as much as I didn't like being a student, I realized that's actually what I am always good at being. Hmm. So hmm. that's really interesting. So yeah, you've always been a good student, and so then for you, this idea of starting a podcast where you kind of learn from people about something you care about really sounds like it was kind of your sweet spot. Yeah, totally. I mean, I realized early. I mean, I'm a podcast fan from back in the day where I was working a data entry job the summer of 2005 and uh, with my Windows machine at work popped up, oh, iTunes has a new update. So I uh, said, okay, quick, bathroom break and grab a coffee and let it run. And then I sit back down and there's this thing on the sidebar that says podcasts. <laughs> and I go into it and I'm like, what is this? And I'm like, oh, it's radio shows like TiVo where I can download it and listen to it at any time and pause it. This is amazing. And instantly said, oh, I want to do this. Because hmm. I'd already done radio internships in college about three, four years before that. And so I knew from having a passion for the audio content world that I wanted to do that. So it wasn't long, you know, two, two years later, I was actually, most people don't know this. I was actually doing like a comedy podcast daily with a friend of mine and, uh, December, 2007, iTunes named us one of the top 10 new comedy podcasts That's way back amazing. in the early days. Yeah. That's so amazing. I kind of cut my teeth on that. I so, think, I mean, I'm wondering if you go back and I mean, you would know this better than I would, but the first podcast I listened to was some, I forget what it was called, but it was like a recap of Lost. I mean, it was, you know, they would dive into every episode yeah. or something and it was in 2006. And so I think I've always had this idea that podcasts in the beginning were sort of more entertainment based. Like we hadn't really figured out that they could be like a learning tool. Is that actually true though? That's very true. That it, when it first started, there was, in fact, I had uh, a connection to a lost podcast oh. early on. So I, I probably know which one. And there's probably like about three or four of them that one of them was the one you listened to. I'm I know. Sure. It's, it'll come to me. The name will come yeah. to me like as I'm running later today or something like yeah. that because I can't think of it. But it's, yeah, but go on. But yeah, it, I mean, it was very entertainment based. It was very ham radio, talking back and forth. Mm. People would send in clips, and then the host would comment, and and then it would be a. I mean, it was a back and forth medium. It was almost audio social media. Mm. So, hmm. so then what happened? Then we just decided that it started to become more programmatic and more polished. But I think there's still something to be said for moving back to a give and take. Uh, podcast. In fact, I'd like to do some of those episodes with my listeners at some point here. So, hmm. all right. So, <laughs> okay. So you've spent four years now interviewing folks every week, right? Pretty much. Pretty much every week. So I'm I'm very hopeful that you have learned some exciting gems along the way. Yes, I wouldn't be much of a student if I hadn't learned. <laughs> Over four years. That's a college degree in productivity at this point. That, that is. So, it's a college degree in productivity. So yeah. So are there any interesting interviews or insights that have really stood out for you? There's a lot of them that stand out. I mean, I, I went through the catalog in preparation for this to try and see, you know, what really stands out. And what's funny is, is you and I just recorded one and it, a lot of them fall into one or the other of the categories of either doing things mm -hmm. or no, sorry, choosing what to do or then doing it well. Okay. It's either, it's either an intention hmm. and a deciding what to do mm -hmm. or an execution, mm -hmm. how to act mm -hmm. on what you know you need to do mm -hmm. better or faster. Or, so it kind of falls in those two categories. So uh, with regards to the first one, intention, the the key thing that kept coming up was saying no, mm -hmm. being able to say no to pretty much, you know, having a blanketed no on everything and having the right filters as they come in as requests for your time, your attention, uh, your energy come in. That has to do with distraction, commitments, uh, even your own expectation on yourself. Sometimes we have to have a talk with ourselves to kind of check what expectations we have of ourselves. Wow. So right. um, the the idea of opportunity cost, which if we're not, for, you know, if you're not familiar with that, it's when you say yes to one thing, you're always saying no to something else and vice versa. So it's kind of like a bank account. You know, if you spend your money on this thing, you then don't have it. And we're working through this with my 
two kids right now. So if you spend it on this toy, then you don't have it for this other toy. And so <laughs> you have to have kind of a calling out of, okay, where is my time, my attention, my energy going to go to? Because if I say yes to something, I've then said no to something else. I mean, and I just love that idea of saying it's like a bank account and then saying, you know, you're working with your two kids on it right now because, yeah, kids can try to learn that about money when they're little and then adults, when it comes to time, can just forget it all when they're adults. Mm -hmm. Well, Dave Ramsey's built his whole career on the, the fact that adults don't even know how to do that. So. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah. So, and that kind of moves into this idea that when deciding what to do, and, and, and in fact, there's a really great series, it's a series, really, that's ongoing with Jeff Goins, hmm. who's been on the show three times, and each mm -hmm. time it's a new book, but it's, in a, it's, it's a thematic series in a way. I can't wait to see where he goes next. Hmm. But it's this idea of uh, doing what you're called to do, okay. and it's this overarching I don't know what I'm I don't know what I'm designed to do. I don't know what I'm made to do. I don't know what I'm supposed to do and that we feel stuck not no, when we quote unquote don't know what we're supposed to do. Right. But that doesn't that's not an ex, that's not an excuse for inaction. Mm -hmm. And that any of that uh it, one of the things that I love when I was talking to him about was just this idea and it's freed me up personally. Um this idea that even if you don't know there are still things that you're committed to right now or things you want to try. And if you take action on those, it's not wasted action. It's, in a sense, the, the whole Malcolm Gladwell 10,000-hour rule. Right. You're still ticking off hours towards something, hmm. even if you don't know what it is. Because that experience of trial and error and you know successes and failures – they're just experiments. They're not wasted. You, you still got. You still have the data to be able to look back and say, especially in hindsight, we often realize we don't know where it is we're going necessarily, but we can see the design and the plan in it as we move forward, especially when we look backwards. So there's kind of a piece in that I find mm. when I look when I especially when I look backwards, I see oh there's definitely a direction here, even if I still don't know right this second what the next five years looks like right now is pretty good and it's better than before. And so I can make better decisions now than I used to. So, okay. So how is that different than, you know, this idea that we hear in productivity that you don't just want to be kind of on a hamster wheel or just busy for the sake of being busy. Right. So talk, dig into that a little more in yeah. terms of if we don't really know what's next, why is it good to do something? Well, so for example, and again, I've got to talk to the fact that you and I just recorded an episode and the fact that it was not a wasted time period by any means for you to know that the nine months or just shy of that you were carrying your daughter, mm -hmm. that surviving was just, that was the bar hmm. and you met, you met that. Hmm. And so it's give, it gives yourself the ability to get to give yourself grace, to mm -hmm. give yourself a pass once in a while. This is another mm -hmm. thing that comes up all the time in terms of uh, what you decide to do in the macro level of calling, but all the mi the micro of day to day is you've got to give yourself grace. You've got to give yourself forgiveness and a pass. Actually, pretty often the the best most expert people out there do that and realize it's not about every day being perfect it's about every day doing something that adds to the scale that incremental change is then possible over time mm -hmm. so i've learned okay stop beating yourself up you didn't get the whole list done today move some stuff over to next to the next day also why did you have so much stuff on that list today <laughs> <laughs> you know and so um but to go back to you know the primary question you had was, uh, yeah, there's this, this idea that um, we need to, we don't want to be on a hamster wheel and we want to make the right decisions about what we're going to do. And yes, it can sound wasteful to take action on things that we don't necessarily uh, feel are heading towards something, mm -hmm. but there's something good in daily completing something and practicing that. 
it practices it, it, it forms a muscle if you will mm-hmm. it, it's a it's still forming discipline and character if you will that's mm-hmm. that's what i'm getting at here is that again what jeff and i both were, were talking about was it's not wasted activity if it's still developing you to mm-hmm. do good work and make wise choices because once that revelation comes of oh my gosh this is my calling you then have this eye-opening experience looking backwards that none of the struggle to get there was wasted. The struggle is real, but the yes. struggle is not wasted. <laughs> there you go. There's a tweetable quote right there. I'm wondering, and you didn't know I was going to ask you this, but I'm curious if you think the people that have been on your show work more or work less than the average worker be out there Mm -hmm. i think gosh i I actually think they both i think they fall into both categories Hmm. there are some that i know don't do very much on a daily basis and then hustle through something through a season get it get it done okay and that's appealing to me sometimes there's other people who that would that would wreck them and they have to do something every day or they feel like they're not you know, on task. And in fact, they, they will burn the midnight oil more often than not. Hmm. I, I, I think I fluctuate between both of those. Hmm. So now these days, what are you doing on an average week in terms of work hours and time spent? Are you, you say you're fluctuating between those two. Yeah. Well, and, and so I have, I'm in a weird space now. Um, I have my solid and we just so I work for Social Media Examiner. We Mm -hmm. just finished our annual giant live conference in San Diego, Social Media Marketing World, which Mm -hmm. was amazing Mm -hmm. yet again. Mm -hmm. And now that that's done, it's like (sighs) I can get a, I have a, a, you know, I can breathe again a little bit. And so my life for my day job has just gone back to another. It's just entered into a new season Hmm. for the summer and into the fall. So my um, 40 hour a week work week that was up to 50 and 60 hours and more has now gone back down to 40 ish. Hmm. And so that there's that. And then there's the show beyond the to do list, which is a side thing. And I batch that. So I guess I do oh, hustle. Okay. So talk I, so to us about batching. Yeah, I love yeah. batching, but some people don't know what it is. Yeah. So for example, this week uh, I recorded an episode with you and then uh, three or four others. And so suddenly I've got a whole month mm. to a month and a half of shows ready to get me through for another, uh, you know, again, month, month, month and a half if I'm doing a weekly schedule. And by being able to do that and push a bunch through and say, okay, there's the arc there where we talked about this with this person, this with this person, and spacing it out, um, it's it's almost like mini television seasons or mini character arcs, yeah. which I love. I love doing it that way because having to record one a week and then putting it right out there isn't really my style. I like to look forward. I like to I like to sit and brainstorm and say, okay, what topics does my do my audience want to hear from? or learn from who do they want to hear from Mm -hmm. and, and kind of do a swath of, Hey, let me contact a bunch of people, get a bunch of interviews scheduled, do them all at once, be done with it and be on and then be off again. So that's, that's the podcast, uh, scheduling at least. Well, so that's interesting. So it sounds like you are batching more for the audience or more for sort of the, the output or the quality of the programming you're getting out, right? But some of us, I think, batch for our own kind of internal mm-hmm. processing because switching between different tasks is very challenging. Well, and that's that's the, I would say that the audi- serving the audience better has has actually become a bonus or a mm-hmm. byproduct. But what right. you said is actually the intent was I want to be done with it for a while and then pick it back up again and not have it be an ongoing thing because it's it's me working in the margins Hmm. of life to make it happen so this reminds me of you know so i've kind of always been a batcher before i knew there was a name for it and when i was in college i used to do this thing where i would go out of my way to have like two crazy days of classes on tuesday and thursday and then super light and sometimes no classes on monday wednesday and friday right and you know, there are huge benefits to batching. I'm a big fan of batching. I do it in my own work life today, absolutely consistently. 
But I also see that sometimes you can take it too far and you can totally become burned out by that. And when I look back on what I used to do in college, I realized that actually I was I was taking it too far because those two days, that Tuesday and Thursday day, were were just out of control and I would be so burnt out afterwards that it didn't really matter that I had nothing to do on Wednesday because, you know, I didn't want to get out of bed or whatever it is. I did the exact same thing. I know oh. there was a semester or two where literally my Tuesday and my Thursday, mm-hmm. like I had classes all day, the mm-hmm. shorter ones on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, I thought I'll be able to get my work done mm-hmm. then and take a break when I need to. Mm-hmm. And what inevitably happened, unfortunately, more often than not, was I'd wake up on a Tuesday Go eat breakfast at about 9.30 or 10 in the morning. Think to myself, I have nothing to do today. And then waste it versus yeah. actually even doing something fun that was c- cool because I had the time to do it. So yeah. Yeah. That, that pacing. So, so batching is pacing. great, mm-hmm. but that, it actually makes the case for, you know, oh, well, if I have classes every single day, but it's less, then I still have all those afternoons that where it's like, Oh, well, I'll do something then instead. So, yeah, it can go both ways. It's it's much more about your personal style, which is one of the other things that I picked up on is it's like no one thing works for everybody, even though there are some overarching principles that apply to everybody, which I've kind of already spoken to. Have you heard of things over the course of the last four years where you've heard something and you just think immediately that would not work for me? That is not my personal productivity style. Uh, uh, definitely. Uh, the, for me, the whole night owl thing does not oh, work for me. Okay. Uh-huh. I have maybe once in my life pulled an all nighter. Okay. Because yeah. inevitably I get to the point where it's about four in the morning and I'm just like, okay, I got to grab a couple hours of sleep or I'm not going to function tomorrow. Right. And staying up late is just not my thing. I've, I am old for some reason, early. I don't know. Old, early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think, Even before having kids, that was true. It was just – and I had a second shift job for a while where I started work at 2 in the afternoon and was up working till about 11 something. And then I would stay up till 1 or 2 because I couldn't go right to bed after work. And then I would get up at about 8 or 9 the next morning or so. And that that was a season of life. When that was over, I immediately ditched that. And I was in bed usually 10 or 11 at night. Hmm. And up and now you know i'm i'm in bed between nine and ten mm-hmm. and i'm up usually between five and six because that's, right. that's when nobody else is up in my house and I, it's either me time or action time or action me time or action time that's a great yes. those are great phrases also i was speaking to someone who was um talking about how this typical sort of productivity advice to you know get up um, in the morning and do your do your big work first, your big task, you know, eat that frog first is often completely not relevant to particularly to people who serve as some type of caregiver to their kids, basically parents. Mm, yes. <laughs> I think there are probably very few parents out there that don't feel that they serve as caregivers in the morning in some way. <laughs> um, so it's interesting how, you know, some people say, okay, some people are able to, you know, get up at four if you've got a if you've got a toddler and they love to wake up like you know, at 3 a.m. or whatever. You know what I mean. When you've got a toddler, they wake up really early. But if you've got a toddler waking up early, so some people are able to say, I'm going to wake up at 4 instead of 5.30 when the toddler gets up to to be able to get that me time in. But some people are just saying, hey, that's just not possible for this season of life, which is also interesting. Yeah, that that is the biggest piece, I think, is just realizing that no one structure or system works throughout your entire life. There may be certain things you cling to that work for you always, Mm -hmm. but you have to be willing to throw stuff out. In fact, I mean, one of the biggest things for me was the fact that I made a major shift about halfway through the four years of doing the show where suddenly I was not working in a day job where I went to an office. I was now working remotely from home Mm. and I had to figure out oh, crap, how do I get my work done at home Hmm. when there's no one here to see me do it? There's, you know, there's the accountability issue. Mm -hmm. There's the expectation issue. There's uh, the work environment issue Mm -hmm. where, hey, there's a couch right there. Let me me sit with my laptop on the couch, and inevitably you get less done that way. The TV's always around. It's like, hey, my lunch hour turned into a two-hour lunch by accident today. Um, 
Uh, let's see. There's, I know there's a couple other pieces. Well, family being around and how the schedule, the coming and going that you were never part of before is now suddenly something that directs your day or unless you figure out how to direct your day yourself and be, uh, hence I'm out here in my upstairs loft of my garage at my standing desk, which again, that makes a whole other difference. So I love the standing desk. I, I'm very, I resonate very much with that idea of sort of the coming and going. My husband is an architect, and so he built the house we live in, which is ooh, amazing and a total luxury to have like your husband be the architect when you're thinking about how you want to design the house. And I remember when we were going through the process of designing, I said at the time, it's very important to me that my office be inside the house. And mm -hmm. I immediately realized then that that was something I thought before I had little kids. Because, yes. you know, my office is on the ground floor of the house and sometimes I literally feel like I'm in Grand Central Station because how do you, I mean, how do you keep a two-year-old out of your office? It's pretty impossible. You know? It's hard. It, there's even an episode where, and I left it in, but I'm talking to somebody oh. and suddenly, suddenly my daughter is over here and my son is up on the treadmill and he's walking and I didn't hear them come in and she's like, dad, Evan's on the treadmill. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I'm, and what was ironic was I was talking to somebody about hustling mm -hmm. in life mm -hmm. and how you do that when you have kids. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, I'm totally leaving this in. Give me a sec. That's and great. then, so it was, it was very fun. That's fantastic. So th this has been, you know, super, super valuable. I'm wondering if you can kind of give folks one you know tip if someone comes to you and says hey i'm i'm super busy and overwhelmed and i don't even know where to start sort of getting my life in order is there kind mm -hmm. of one thing that you've you've seen in in what you've learned from these experts that you think is is really kind of a valuable thing to try yeah um i would say i i always go back this is something i do regularly um it's kind of a GTD thing, getting things done, mm -hmm. David Allen. And it's just doing something called a brain dump. Mm -hmm. So go somewhere, maybe for a set amount of time, maybe reward yourself with a coffee, go there, sit down. It can be public or it can be a private place, but you sit down, use analog tools, pen and paper. If I, I, I choose that because it's I like the like tactile uh function but you can use you know you can use a laptop or an ipad or whatever but just sit there with your thoughts as scary as that may be and just start writing everything down that's on your mind it may be mm. oh i've got to do this that's coming up so and so's birthday this wedding's in three weeks i really want to write this book or this ebook i want to oh that's a good blog post idea uh, I want to have that person on my podcast by being it, it. All these things are up in your brain and they're mm -hmm. taking up your mental Ram. Mm -hmm. And if you can get them out of there and off your mind and then into a place where you can then even start to decide what to do with them, mm -hmm. or even if you don't decide immediately, but you say, okay, there's a bunch of stuff here. Not all of it. Am I going to do right now? But here's three things that I didn't realize I've been thinking about and have been stressing me out. And I know the next thing to do on those so I can move it forward and get a quick win. You're going to feel better. You're going to feel better from getting it out of your head first off. You're going to feel even better by getting a quick win by doing something small, hopefully, to knock something. And hopefully there's something there that's a two-minute thing and then it's done. And then you're like, oh, I feel really good. So I love it. that's the tip. I love brain dumps. Great yes. suggestion. So tell tell people what you're working on today and where folks can find you. Uh, I am working on – I actually am working on really upping <laughs> – I'm like – I'm looking at leveling up my show for the rest of this year at beyondthetodolist.com. That is actually something that is really uh, on my mind and on my heart to uh, just take it even more seriously and – no, there's these people who are getting so much out of it. All right, how can I be even more intentional and even give more value back? So, yeah, beyond the to-do list dot com. That's awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Eric. This is great. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.